rule and the mischief rule. Anyone studying law would understand this. And this applies to the Islamic narrative too. Because the Quran is not only a spiritual text, but it's a legal book. And this is why we need to understand Islam with the tools it has given us to interpret it. We can't just take a statement and run away with it. We do this all the time. For example, in Britain, there's a chef called Sheikh Ethan. He's a scholar. And, you know, little crazy kids, Muslims, we go up to him all the time and say, Yeah, chef. Oh, chef. There is a prophetic tradition and it says blah, 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 blah. And the chef replies, when has Islam just been one prophetic tradition? Because you need the whole corpus of material to understand the tradition for itself, whether it's religious, secular, or irreligious. And let me just give you an example. Let's take women's inheritance. Now, in parts of Islamic law, some un unmarried women will get half of inheritance. Who thinks this is unjust? Put your hand up. Only three people and they're all Muslim? <laughs> okay, well, generally, you think this is unjust. I agree. If we see this from a liberal secular context, it is unjust. But the beauty of the Islamic tradition, it is very holistic. All laws contribute to other laws. Let me give you an example. Having half inheritance is unjust, if taken to be on its own. But if we take this ruling or this law in the context of all of the Sharia, of all of the Islamic comprehensive model, then we see that it actually works. Why? Because women in Islam don't have to pay for their own clothing. Women in Islam don't have to pay for their own housing. Women in Islam don't have to pay for their education. Women in Islam don't even have to pay for their own makeup. <laughs> Honestly. That's the reality, people. That is the reality. So when you see this in context, it means women have excess wealth. So they don't need that much inheritance. Do you see how it all interlinks? And now, let's talk about the punishments the last few minutes. Now, when we look into the Sharia, we always see these very cute caricatures. Let me give you an example. Name me, what's a famous supermarket in California? Albertsons. Sorry? Albertsons. Kmart, right? Kmart? <laughs> Kmart. Key, is it Kima Mitsmi or something? Super King Market. Super King Market, okay. <laughs> Super King Market, right? Say we have... Okay, radio. Radio's off, radio's off. Super King Market, okay? We have a sister. Sister Aisha, okay? What's the woman? She's wearing the, the niqab. All you can see is two bright eyes, all right? She even covers her hands, all right? She's all in black. And she has a sword right down, <laughs> right down her cloak. She's holding it like this, ever waiting. There's a man, Muslim man called Abdullah. And his beard is up to his belly button. And there's a poor Californian kid and he's running into Super King Supermarket. <laughs> and he steals a cookie because he's hungry. And then Abdullah with his big beard trips him and he falls on the floor. And the woman with the sword, she unsheathes the sword, gets his hand and cuts it and goes, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> this is the caricature that is painted in Fox News. This is the cartoon of a legal comprehensive framework that's being detailed over centuries. We must transcend this. Because we never listen to the reality of Sharia law. First and foremost, Sharia law is not just about few penal punishments. It's about being good to your neighbor, about community cohesion, about so many different things. But from this specific reality, we must understand that the penal code is based upon an underlying philosophy. And this underlying philosophy is that a deterrent mechanism in society is more useful to prevent crime. And this, Muslims don't only claim this, this is a detailed academic response to social problems. For example, the late professor of Fordham University, Ernest van der Aard, he said, what is feared most, deters most. Also, we must understand that Islamic law provides higher burdens of proof. 
it's not beyond reasonable doubt in the liberal tradition. It's actually, you need to have conclusive evidence to actually get someone through the Sharia courts. <coughs> it's not jungle justice, it's based upon rule of law, due process. And we need high burdens of proof. For example, professor of law at Harvard University, he says, and his name is Noah, Noah Feldman, he says, today, when we invoke the harsh punishments prescribed by the Sharia for a handful of offenses, we rarely acknowledge the high standards of proof <coughs> necessary for the implementation. And in this light, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, if a person has a way, which means an alibi and excuse, <coughs> let them go. For it is better for a judge to make a mistake in dismissing charges than implying than applying the punishment on an innocent. innocent. So to summarize the Sharia law part of today's discussion is that it's not jungle justice, it's a comprehensive legal framework. It's actually there to be a deterrent rather to be implemented. Even the Prophet himself, a person that we see who had divine revelation, would say to people, go away. Go away when they said, I've done something really bad, please punish me. He would say, go away. Because we know in our tradition that forgiveness comes first. If God has screened you from a public criminal act or a private criminal act, you ask for forgiveness and God will forgive you. And this is the reality of the Islamic tradition. And I hope by just detailing some things about women, about progress, about Islam and rationality, about various other misunderstandings about the Islamic way of life. I hope we've come to the position where we have a Q&A which is going to be upstairs apparently. Yeah.